Hey everyone, this is Jaime Alejandro and I'm joined by Maddie, who is my wife and she does have permission to speak. This isn't an old timey show or anything. She just chooses not to. I want to make sure that that is clear. <laughs> What's up? I'm good. I'm good. So we want to talk about Ted Lasso, right? This is it. This is the special, special edition Ted yes. Lasso episode. So for some of you who may not be aware, let's catch you up real quick. Maddie and I binged Ted Lasso season one and two in about a week. <laughs> yeah. That is how <laughs> it definitely was insanely ensnaring this show is. It kind of sucks you in and you get taken away into this world of fantasy football. So that's what that is, right? Fantasy football. I guess football? it is. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it really, considering, I mean, I guess I thought it was a sports show. Yeah. And so I was like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't, but it's really not about yeah. that at all. So can you tell me the premise? Because you're really good at setting premises. And then we can cover season one and two, which is why it's going to be riddled with spoilers. If you have yet to watch any of this, please go and watch the show. Enjoy it. We highly recommend it. But for you diehard folks who want to get into the deep cuts of the situations, this is the episode for you because Maddie and I have a lot to talk about. So I'll let you take it away. Yeah. So Ted Lasso is... Um... It's a show um, starring Jason Sudeikis, and he plays a an American college football coach. And um, yeah, there you go. And he is hired by a Premier League. What's wrong? I just got to tighten your mic. Oh, okay. He's hired by a a Premier League football team in England to be their manager. And he knows nothing about soccer. He knows nothing about the premier league and, um, hilarity ensues. Yeah. And that's kind of like the, the amazing premise. It originated from a sketch that Jason Sudeikis did for MSNBC. I believe it was 2013 or 2014 when they were making a big push to get Americans to watch the premier league. Mm -hmm. So I thought like that was such a curious thing. Initially, it was just him kind of messing around, and you see him get hired for Tottenham. That was a team that initially oh. hired him. And in another skit, they ask him, how long did you last at Tottenham? And he was like, uh, six hours. <laughs> <laughs> they kicked him out. Um, but it's interesting to see because you have there the prime material, the initial, um, I guess, foundation for what the character was going to be and there were some jokes in the skits that were actually made uh actually included into the show which oh. i thought was really cool but coach beard was there and like the basic idea was there kind of felt like the first couple of minutes of the pilot episode were from that skit oh yeah and i thought that was really cool mm -hmm. but to see it fully fleshed out into what it became just the first pilot alone uh it was pretty revelatory it just you knew it was going to be a wild ride. Yeah, I um, I really didn't know what to expect from it, but the um, surprisingly, the like peripheral characters are so rich. You know, like the the owner of the football of the of the club is a woman named Rebecca Welton, mm -hmm. and she's, you know. She's just been divorced. She's been, you know, cheated on. And so she's trying to get back at her ex mm -hmm. by fucking up his favorite thing in the world, which is this football club. Yeah. And so she goes and hires Ted, who will be the destroyer of the team, supposedly. Yeah. And that is where the, the majority of the conflict comes from, is you initially know that these people are not rooting for him nobody's rooting for him and you are caught in this dilemma of supporting him or jeering him and i think that he wins everyone over and it's so intoxicating that i'm i'm really delighted to see that like we don't see a show about joy yeah you know we because we we realize that I guess as dramatists, that conflict is everything, right? But it doesn't have to be in the traditional way of 
you know, one person thinks this and the other person thinks this. I think this show does a really good job of, <clears throat> excuse me, establishing the the main theme of this, which seems to be love, joy prevails, and kindness. Like overall, you know, like you feel like this is going to get really serious. There's, or I actually, no, I didn't think that it was going to escalate. You know, I thought it was going to stay kind of on the surface, don't you think? When yeah, you first started, I don't know. I think initially I did think that. And then the further in you get, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like they're really hitting on some like heavy topics. Yeah. And um, it just seemed like, yeah, it, it did escalate quickly, but in a way that was surprising. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like, it just, I don't know, like the scene where Rebecca comes clean mm -hmm. was like so astonishing to me for some reason, because in any other show, that would have been like a huge blowout scene. Yeah. You know, like that would have led to this huge fight. Right. You know, and maybe even the, the end of that friendship or that working relationship. Mm -hmm. And he just forgives her. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that that kind of like radical kindness, like that's what Ted is. Yeah. He embodies radical kindness, radical empathy. Yeah. That's right. And, and radical forgiveness. And that's kind of the curious thing about it, that you don't typically see a male figure mm -hmm. portrayed in that way or carrying that message or delivering that message, which I think is what makes the show unique. Like, um, there is a lot of conversation on the internet. I've been, you know, as soon as episode 11 of the second season ended, I've been scouring the internet, looking for perspectives on what's going on, what potentially is going to happen. And we're going to get into some of the season two stuff, but just examining the overall ideas of the show manhood and emotional capacity the emotional intelligence to know oneself is a big a big part of the exploration of the show and you feel like ted is just the perfect vehicle for that exploration because all of the things that men worry and think about and talk about is is what challenges him in a way and it's it's the kind of radical empathy and radical kindness that that you talked about that allows him to sort of placate some of these unnecessary conflicts you know and that's what it feels like it feels like everything is is unnecessary in in certain what am i trying to say like not that things don't matter but that it's okay Mm -hmm. to feel the way that you feel but you don't have to let it kill you mm -hmm. you don't have to let it destroy you and of course we can get into the details of you know kind of what's going on in ted's life too but you know yeah um sorry my microphone keeps like migrating <sighs> what was i saying um well I, w I was saying that um ted is kind of like that gateway to empathy mm -hmm. and kindness and that it's rare to see that portrayed through a male perspective. Yeah. And maybe that's, um, I think especially like when you juxtapose Ted against British people. Yeah. Who are a little bit, they're reserved. They don't like to talk about their feelings. They're not very forward about their feelings. Yeah. And um, that's even funnier because He's right. very open or seemingly open. He's kind of a chatterbox. He's he's very emotional. He's, you know, talking everyone's ear off, which, you know, is... Yeah, and you make me think of something here that the writers very cleverly touched on, right? You have Ted, who just by default is going to be a different kind of energy than the rest of the supporting cast, that there is built-in conflict in culture. Mm -hmm. Right. And they don't need to worry so much about just being that or, or creating sort of like the, the, the right climate for conflict because it's just there by nature, just mm -hmm. because of where he is and what the premise is. 
but that allows Ted to actually be the life force of the show. Uh, and it reminds me of musical theater rules. Like there's a theory that we learned when we were studying musical theater that your protagonist of a musical is like the life force of the show. And sometimes the, the other lead figure in the show is, is sort of like they're two magnets and they're coming together and everything else is just kind of a barrier to get them to, you know, that is getting in the way of them coming together. Mm -hmm. And so eventually through song or through plot or, you know, whatever kinds of actions, they end up together, but it, it's treated in more of a, a sense of forces coming together. Mm. And I think that that approach, or at least that idea in my head, helps me f kind of rationalize what Ted is doing, how he reacts in that environment, and how I think eventually him and Rebecca are going to end up together. Yeah. I think that's that's my biggest thing. Like I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen, but I don't know. There's a lot yeah. of twists and turns. I think the first season is. A lot of the first season is just Ted slowly winning people over mm -hmm. with his personality, with his just his magnetism. Yeah. Like they can't deny him. <laughs> like they just can't, you know, like I think uh, so Roy Kent is like the. Let's you know, talk about Roy. <laughs> yeah. He's like the elder statesman of the team. You know, he's older and, and more experienced and just grumpy and hates everyone. But he, there's this really awesome scene where, you know, they have like the suggestion box and everybody puts their suggestions in. And, and then Ted and Coach Beard are reading them after at the bar. And you know, most of them are like wanker, or like go home, whatever, <laughs> like they're derogatory, you know, like, and there's one that says uh, something like the water pressure in the shower is a shit or something. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, all right, we're going to fix the, you know, set that one aside. Yeah. And then Roy goes into the showers the next day and the, the shower pressure is fixed. <laughs> and in that moment, you can see like a turn, mm. you know, like. And in, in specifically in Roy, that's a big deal because Roy is not an easy person to turn. Yeah. And I don't know. I think it's interesting to see the dominoes fall yeah. throughout the season, you know, of because of, right. everyone is just like, oh, he's an idiot. You know, he's not he doesn't know what he's doing. This mm -hmm. is going to be a disaster. You know, meanwhile, Rebecca is sort of like snickering to herself because she's the one that orchestrated this. But everyone else is like, what the hell's going on? Like, mm -hmm. and you know, slowly they start winning folks over. And, and just mm -hmm. to give a bit of context uh, for the character of Roy Kent, who for sure, for anyone who follows Premier League or uh, Manchester United, Roy Keane is, I, you know, he's, he's got to be the foundation for this character. He, he was one of the greatest defensive midfielders of, of his generation won everything with uh, Manchester United. And he was known to be, that kind of persona who is, you know, and, and I think they cast Brett Goldstein for the part because he kind of has that same look. Oh. If he doesn't smile, he looks like a hard ass. Yeah. Like he's going to take you down, even if he's a member of your team. Yeah. And I, I think just specifically just talking about Brett Goldstein, I think he does a phenomenal job of channeling that energy and he becomes a great foil in the beginning for Ted and just representing this space that is so negative and so anti-Ted that he starts chipping away at it and, and Ted eventually wins out mm -hmm. in my in my thinking. But I'm sorry if I ramble, but that's the great thing about Ted is that he doesn't give up. Mm -hmm. He's always looking at the positive. And of course, you may say that he doesn't know anything about soccer. He's going to be a shitty coach. But at the core of it, he's he's just so deeply committed to motivating people you know i don't know like it it it's so weird because you have this you have jason sudeikis who is playing this character up in a way like he's very lively very animated but to me like after episode one he never felt like a caricature to me isn't that weird yeah. like how those things even can though fit. he's like so big yeah and, like yeah 
you know, kind of silly, but like, yeah, you're right. He never feels like a caricature. Yeah, especially heaven forbid in the in the <clears throat> last half of the the first season, and then all of the second season. That's a full human being. That is a full 3D, you know, person. Mm-hmm. That <laughs> it it just boggles my mind how the creative team was able to do that to give that that character so much humanity. Mm-hmm. It's a marvel. Yeah. I think um, it's interesting watching it from a perspective of like not knowing that much about about soccer. Like mm-hmm. I know a little bit, mm-hmm. but I don't have the context that you do about the Premier League and like all the rules and stuff. Like, <laughs> so it's interesting to watch it with somebody who does know that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think even if you don't know anything about any of it, it's still enjoyable. Yeah. And- I mean, it's a show that uses football and in particular English football as its backdrop, but it's not, it's not the main focal point of it. Mm -hmm. I think the, the main factor in here is how does a team work? How do you bring a great group of people together? And I I just think it's inspiring as hell. Mm -hmm. Like I laugh a lot during that show Yeah, and I know that we're going to watch it again. We're probably going to start it, you know, tonight or tomorrow yeah. because we we love the show so much but um there is so much heart i can't get over that there's yeah. so much heart in that show and i think um i don't know i was thinking about um i was thinking about keely and keely is um initially she starts out as um jamie tart's girlfriend who Jamie, is the asshole of the group? Yeah, the other asshole. Jamie Tart is like the the golden boy, you know, the young one. Cocky. And yeah, very cocky, very arrogant. And Keely's just kind of like his side piece, you know. And um initially I didn't you didn't think much of Keely, but then all mm-hmm. of a sudden, like she just she just <laughs> comes out of nowhere and she's just this like tour de force character that like I cannot get enough of. And she's the actress juno temple is she's so dynamic like she's she has these moments these big kind of girlish moments you know with rebecca where they're just like squealing and like she's saying crazy (laughs) shit like you know she gets to see rebecca naked and she's like can't even believe it like a picture of her and then there's these moments between her and like brett goldstein where they're not even saying anything and you just like just the 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 amount of acting that's being done with not not one word <laughs> is just yeah. incredible to me and i think that that's there's not a lot of women in the show but the two women like the main characters are incredible yeah um it's it's good to hear you say that i think because obviously we've talked about this before we were podcasting but the the female characters are just as well conceived as any of the male characters. And, you know, Rebecca as, as a, she's also a protagonist of the show. You know, she carries a lot of the dramatic weight of the show and, you know, Hannah Waddingham is phenomenal. Like, you know, I, I showed you that clip where she was, uh, you know, a musical theater gal. So yeah. she was like doing a lot of the singing and it's really kind of awesome that they allowed her to sing too because you know from being in spam a lot on the west end you know yeah. to having that kind of trajectory to doing this kind of show it shows the range of an actor and mm-hmm. you know those are just two of the of the many examples of great acting in the show uh every single actor in the show is well placed well cast and it, it's just amazing I feel like I'm gushing a lot about it, but there's very little criticism that I have about the show. Yeah. You know, it just feels like such a welcoming world to live in mm-hmm. that I just can't get enough of it. Yeah. I think um, one of the most interesting characters they introduced later on was um, Dr. Sharon. Like, yeah. I think yeah. so, from like a sports perspective, introducing like a sports psychologist for a team that is floundering Mm. makes a lot of sense, you know, because clearly something is amiss. You know, (laughs) the team is not doing well and not functioning well. Um, 
And I think what she ends up doing for Ted Mm -hmm. is the most transformative thing that happens to that character. Yeah. But they had a long way to go before they got there. And it's, it's kind of crazy to talk about this show because we're trying to encapsulate two seasons worth of stuff, except for the last episode, Mm -hmm. which is going to come out on Sunday or Friday, Friday. Friday, Yeah. And I, I think that that was one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge that Ted had, because you have a, a figure of emotional authority, like, you know, a psychologist mm-hmm. who initially is kind of confronting Ted on his own terms, you know, in terms of uh, motivating, getting to understand people and that sort of thing. And it's also exposing all of his his own baggage and the way that they humanize the psychologist too. It's like a perfect storm for, for drama, but for us to even get there, like the building blocks leading up to that just kind of made perfect sense. Like they came in with that character at the right time, Mm -hmm. which was, I think like a third of the way through the second season. No, she came in earlier than that. Like at the beginning? Like either the end or the beginning of the end of the first season or the beginning of the second season. Because he. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was having, he was, he begins to have panic attacks. Right. And they don't bring him in. They don't bring her in for that purpose. They bring her in because the team needs her. But, you know, as soon as they brought her in, I was like. Ted needs her like Ted needs her help (laughs) and I don't know that he's going to know to ask for help yeah because that that reminds me yeah like throughout the the second half of the first season you start to see the cracks Mm -hmm. in a way of of his his Mm well-being just sort of deteriorate uh, especially after his separation yeah and I'm sorry that we're giving stuff away, but I'm really going to label this one spoilers. Yeah. It's, you know, this is going to be spoilers. It's central. hard to talk about it all without giving yeah. away things. This one's for us to express so yeah. much that we feel right now. I don't know. I thought the the mental health stuff. I mean, there's the like sort of the, you know, Dr. Sharon helps like some of the other players first, like like all the players like cycle through her office, <laughs> yeah. you know, and are just like. Like uh, Danny Rojas has that like hang up after he accidentally kills the mascot. Yes. And he can't. Can we talk about Danny Rojas after you're done with that thought? Yes. Okay, great. And has, you know, helps him regain his love of football. And <laughs> and then like, you know, there's a, a couple, like, Jamie Tart goes and sees her and has like this revelation. And um, I just think they set it up really well. And, you know, for someone who has personally experienced panic attacks, um, it's a very, it's a really hard thing to watch, actually. Yeah. Um, because Ted is such a, he he comes off as a very strong, but emotionally intelligent person. And so to see somebody who comes off that way, who whose job it is to motivate other people to crumble like that is really jarring and scary. It's it's scary. Yeah. And, um, I felt a lot of sympathy for him, Mm -hmm. a lot of empathy for him. And like, it's really difficult to watch and you, it's as you're watching it, like, Ted is the one person in this show you don't want to be sad. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. like of all the characters that don't deserve to feel the way he does, he's the one, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and so I think uh I I read a tweet that said um it was like a teacher who had said that one of her students had finally gone in to see a psychologist because he'd seen Ted Lasso see a psychologist. Oh man. And he decided that it was okay because Ted yeah. did it. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, like that's a huge And that's yeah huge that's thing. What I'm talking about when we had that conversation. Cause we've been talking about this for two weeks nonstop. But the power of having that kind of character teach us about the importance of mental health 
especially for men, especially for people who are always at that level. I mean, you know, here in in Wyoming, we we recently had a tragedy where you had an individual who was so well loved because of that larger than life quality, and and you know, we find that there may have been a struggle with with mental health, um, and that's the kind of stuff we're like. We need to be more aware as as men to look after other men because we we are not as easily equipped with this stuff. You know, it it comes easy to some of us, but we have to be more aware of that. You know, and check in on on guys. You know, because mm-hmm. there's stigma. There's a lot of that. Yeah, and of co- and in the show, I mean, the one person that is even aware of it initially is Rebecca. Mm-hmm. Nobody else understands or sees what's happening to Ted. Yeah. But Rebecca sees it. And I think that that's, I think it's really interesting that it's a woman that it, that, that that detects it initially. Yeah. And makes um, that. And makes, yeah. And actually like reaches out and, yeah, you know. Oh man. It's, it's such a complex show, but it never feels like that. It just feels very organic and we're we're trying to unpack a lot of the themes, you know, like another big one is just parenthood and and I guess fatherhood yeah. is the big one. I mean, you have the major through line with Ted's, you know, um, background. And throughout the supporting cast, you get a lot of these stories that are supporting this general idea or this larger picture of of the different outcomes of fatherhood and the importance of a mentor, the importance of somebody to just believe in you. And I think that's such a powerful thing, you know, because as you're growing and you're trying to develop, it's so important that you have somebody to back you up as you're going through this journey. And um, to see, say, you know, and we'll talk about Nate too, because I think that's the biggest Mm. culprit of bad parenting and bad father fathering. yeah, it just kind of left me uh, with a lot to think about. Mm-hmm. But can we talk about Donny Rojas before we get serious again? Yeah. Okay. So when they said that there was going to be the Mexican kid who was injured, I got really excited. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, I got excited because I just want to see more Mexicans on TV. Yeah. I think it's important and representation matters. But the way they introduced Donny Rojas <laughs> was my favorite thing in the whole world. I I love Donny Rojas. I think he is an exemplary human being. And I'm going to get a Donny Rojas shirt here soon. Uh, I was very, very pleased with, yeah, with the character. I mm-hmm. don't know. Like, I, I just feel like, uh, you know, he's doing us proud. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. He's a sweet character. Yeah. And football is life. Football is life. <laughs> and uh Yeah, like initially everyone's irritated by his optimism. <laughs> but eventually he's kind of the he becomes well, sort like, of the cheerleader of the team. It's like, all right, he's he's excited, but he better be good to back it up. Yeah. And then he like starts knocking it out of the park. Yeah. And uh yeah, he gets super hyped. Yeah. Uh and then he said, Oh, this is the way I learned in Guadalajara. Yeah. And I'm like, Yes. <laughs> Full Mexican representation yeah. from the state of Jalisco. What's up? <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah. So I'm I'm very, very glad that he's he's a part of it. Um he seems like a very, very sweet dude. Mm-hmm. Uh Cristo Fernandez is his name. Mm. And uh, he was a um, a soccer player. Really? Yeah. Um, I was wondering how many of those actors are soccer players. I think a couple of them were. Maybe okay. maybe Jamie Tart too. Yeah, but, he's built like a soccer player. Yeah, like, they're they're good to go. Yeah, they are. Um, I don't know. There's so many favorite characters. Who are your favorite characters? Because there's so many of them. It's <sighs> <sighs> so hard. Um. See the best moments. I think all the characters have good moments. Yeah, they all have good moments. It's that's a that's a dumb question. I it's think, hard to put you in that situation. I don't know. Roy Kent has these moments where I just God, <laughs> he's like my spirit animal. Like I can't. Yeah. I just I love him so much. Yeah. And he has this niece named Phoebe that he spends a lot of time with. And those interactions <laughs> are just so cute. It's gold. He's like swearing in front of her, and then she's yeah. like gets in trouble for swearing at school, and 
Oh, oh my man. god. But so again, funny. it's that idea of mentoring because he's the one who's having to look after her because Phoebe's dad is not around and right. his mom works all the time. Yeah. Her mom works all the time. Yeah. So uh I just think it's so delicately placed. Like everything comes down to who are you looking up to? Mm-hmm. You know, what are you taking away from them in, in terms of the things you're learning? It's it's just wonderful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely wonderful. I Sound like a fangirl, fangirling real good tonight. Um, Another um, very uh, much minor, more minor character, but one that I think a lot of people like a lot is Trent Krim of The Independent. Oh, hell yeah. Um, Trent Krim. There's a lot of interaction between the team, well, Ted a lot of the time, and the press, um, because he is the head of a Premier League soccer team. And, you know, initially the interactions are pretty contentious because nobody likes him and everyone (laughs) thinks he doesn't know what he's doing, but he's so disarming to the, even the press. And that's a feat. I think that's the one thing as a constant soccer watcher, especially in the premier league, the press in England is known and notorious to just eat managers alive. Yeah. They don't care about the, tactics so much they just want scandal they want to rile they you want up the sound bite exactly yeah and for for them to do that in this in this fictional world it was so rewarding mm-hmm. and so amazing that like as a soccer fan you're like okay this is special mm-hmm. this is like really cool what's happening right now yeah 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 and i think you know the relationship that he develops with trent Krim is it's it's sweet because he's you know, he's a seasoned reporter. And, jaded. Yeah, very jaded, very cynical. Um, and he just cannot figure Ted out. <laughs> and he, you know, sort of begrudgingly develops this respect for him. And, mm. you know, I, you know, he becomes very important um, near the end of the second season. And um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that, that plays out, out yeah. um, between them. And we have one episode to yeah. clarify all of this stuff and leading to, I guess, the most contentious thing that's going on right now. And everyone on Twitter is talking about it. Everyone online is talking about it who's following the show is the huge change of character that Nate has had mm-hmm. in the last two seasons. So Nate is initially started out as like the kit what do they call him? The kit man. The kit man, which is like the guy who cleans the jerseys and gets the cleats together and all of that stuff. So that's what he does initially. And yeah. then he eventually um, ingratiates himself with Ted and Coach Beard and gets promoted to assistant coach. And the better the team begins to do and the more say that Nate has you start to see him turn from this sweet kind of quiet, you know, doesn't have a lot of self confidence Mm -hmm. to this glory hound. Yeah. You know, and I have a lot of trouble with Nate because they very clearly show you the impetus of this change because clearly his dad is a piece of shit (laughs) and makes him feel like nothing like nothing and he feel you know the only way he feels he can get any kind of respect from his father is if he is at the top he's doing well he's being he's in the paper that he has he's control on, yeah and yeah. and so not that that excuses anything that he does but i fe- i do feel a level of sympathy for him because mm. I don't think that's who he is. Yeah. He, but he's doing what he thinks he needs to do in order to be something his dad will respect. Yeah. It, it's an interesting conversation right now because a lot of folks are saying that, oh, shoot, they made him look like an incel. They turned him into something dark. But I think that is a true manifestation of somebody who has been misguided their entire lives and is desperate for love or affection to just cling to whatever feels good Mm -hmm. or whatever puts him at peace. And so if you have something like 
he made the right choice in a game or he took leadership. He assumed leadership of a situation. He, um, like, uh, Keely gave him affection. Yeah. And it wasn't even, no, it wasn't even affection. It was, it was kindness. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like she was like, uh, making a pass at him or no. anything, but it was the slightest inclination of, of, Hey, you're a human being. Yeah. And then there, there's a distortion that happens. And so this misguided character is just tumbling down out of desperation, wanting to find a bit of, of solace from their self-hatred. You know, yeah. there's all the uh, notorious spitting that's happening, which initially was like, okay, he's empowered. Right. The first time he did that, we're like, he's having a, a turn, you know, like yeah. a, for the better. And he's going to be able to back himself up and he's going to get that table at the restaurant, which was a lovely scene. Like, I really love that scene. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause it just goes to show that you just need to believe in yourself, have a little bit of self-respect and you can start making your way towards something. But when it spirals out of control because of the greed for that feeling, um, then you get what Nate is doing now at the end of, mm -hmm. of the season. And it's so heartbreaking too, because he, he's getting a lot of hate. The character's a lot of getting a lot of hate and the actors getting a lot of hate mm -hmm. because people are stupid and they can't tell the difference between an actor and a character. Yeah. I think the hatred for Nate is, is misguided to be honest. I don't think Nate's a bad character, like a bad person. Yeah. But you know, what's happening too that I, I hadn't realized is um, there is another discussion of like the way he, he treated Keely in that scene and again, spoilers, and if you need the context, he he needed Keeley's help to get a suit, mm -hmm. and and we don't know the motive behind that, like if he knew that's what he wanted to do or what, but people are treating some people. I mean, Twitter is not indicative of the entire Ted Lasso audience, obviously, but they, they were mentioning that that's like a really hard thing to come back from because it's it's, you know sexual assault in a way or mm -hmm. like you know it's crossing a line where that character loses so much of of the empathy that you had for him that it's almost too much and so that's why a lot of folks are saying that he's going to have to be fired from the team mm -hmm. like we can't see him or we have to we have to see him hit a rock bottom to such a degree that he might be welcomed back in a more severe way than what Jamie went through. Yeah. Because he's he's going to have to pay for for what oh, he yeah. did. Oh yeah, what he did is nothing. I mean, what Jamie did is nothing compared to what Nate did. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, no, I'm not saying that like anything that that Nate is doing is excusable. Sure, sure, but But I do think that there is a loss of nuance in talking about Nate because all all I see people focusing on are the actions, but not the reasons behind the actions. Mm -hmm. You know, like the reason he went to get a new suit, and I know that there's speculation that he is going for another job, but I think the reason he asked Keely to take him to go take get to get to get a new suit is because the only suit he had was bought for him by Ted. Mm -hmm. And he, I didn't he, remember that. He kept getting shit for that. Or what he perceived as shit, mm. you know. Um, and so I think he wanted to break away from that. Yeah. And maybe I, even stick it to Ted a little bit. Right. Um, and so I, I don't know. No, like, you, make, you make a really good point because I, I do think that Nate is the one character that is going to force Ted to work the hardest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be the greatest payoff is that I think Ted will eventually get through to him and change him for the better. Um, well, Ted's not going to do it. I mean, Nate's going to change for himself, but Ted is going to have to work really hard at forgiveness, at all of the things that he's preaching, uh, as well as using all of his tools for, for kindness that he has and motivate motivating him. Yeah, I think I think the reason that I don't feel is I don't feel vitriol toward <laughs> Nate is because I can 
I know that he's capable of changing. And I also know that he's capable of kindness because he's done it before. Mm -hmm. You know, like he's capable of being a team player. He's capable of, of loving people. You know, like I don't think that they already set that precedent. That's already there. Yeah. But he's just done so many shitty things that it's recent, you know, like Mm -hmm. the people are mad because of what he did to Keely, but also because of the way he treated the kit man, his replacement. Like that was was pretty shitty. Yeah. Um, I think the thing with Keely, people were really saying that was sexual assault. Yeah. But, but again, Twitter is, is a portion of the, the viewership. Um, I'm trying to think back to that scene. But we all knew that's what was going to happen when he came, he came close and she was helping him with his tie Mm -hmm. and, I, uh, but it's in the eye of the beholder and to some degree, like, yeah, I don't a nuance again. I just don't <laughs> see the nuance in that interpretation. I mean, it was clearly unwanted. That was very clear. Mm. I don't think Keeley interpreted it as sexual assault. I think Keeley's thought and i thought that nate misinterpreted the situation which yeah is most misinterpreted her motivations maybe Mm -hmm. she was also saying things she was the before he kisses her she was saying things about um him going for it and and not going for it the kiss but she was saying like you know just believe in yourself. Yeah, believe in yourself right. and really go for it and get what you want and, yeah. you know, be assertive, you know? <laughs> so she was like pumping him up yeah. to do the things that she thinks he needs to do to be better. Yeah. And he interpreted that as, I'm going to take what oh, I yeah, want and you're what I want in this moment. Yeah. And I, I can see how people interpret it as sexual assault, but that's not really the way I saw the scene. Mm. Well, like you say, it's it's difficult to have nuance, in particular, in an online conversation. And of course, I'm not well versed in online conversation. I'm I'm more of like let's collect the different perspectives and see what's going on. But uh, one of the bigger takeaways for me was just kind of laughing my ass off because somebody, of course, said the most heinous thing that Nate ever did was spit on those mirrors and have somebody else clean it up. <laughs> okay <laughs> like was that a serious tweet no that was that was a uh, unreaded somewhere oh, okay. but you know there's there's so much discussion and so much perspective uh different points of view that i've i've never been so invested in a show that i've spent the last three days looking at other people's opinions on the show mm-hmm. like this has never happened to me before and i even told you like i've never felt the urge to write a script for a show or or follow these characters but this is the one show where like i may do a spec script for it like just to see what that world feels like Mm -hmm. writing for those characters because i care about them so much and i i love that world that they created but with that in mind like i go into these rabbit holes and it's insane to meet any kind of expectation for a show in this day and age but ted lasso seems to be doing it Mm. like i i swear to god like 99 percent of the comments that i read were feverish and desperate for the next episode Mm -hmm. and even in conversation even if there was something to discuss it wasn't because it was a shitty show or it was an, an issue with the show but more like How are they going to resolve this? Because this is too good. Yeah. And usually there's a lot of shit on on the internet about how bad a show is. And I haven't seen it with this show. Mm -hmm. It's it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I was getting at with that. I think it's just kind of like the amount of feedback that they're privy to now. It's it's bound to cause paralysis among some some people. But like these guys are 
doing awesome. I was thinking the other day that that the internet has become the substitute for because you know back in the day like everybody would watch the same shows because there was only like four channels and so you knew that your neighbor also watched the tonight show Mm. you knew your neighbor also watched whatever the fuck bonanza (laughs) like but nowadays there's so much content that you don't really know who's watching what Mm. So the only way we can really connect about TV shows is through the internet. I mean, you know, maybe you recommend it to a friend and the friend also watches it, but you're probably not going to have these deep, deep conversations about the show. And so the the place we go for that conversation is the internet now, mm-hmm. you know, because not everybody's talking about the same shows anymore, right. but you can find the people who are watching the same show as you. and sort of enter that discussion Mm. if you want or just you know be a voyeur like most of us Mm -hmm. um and so i do find myself like when you finish a show or if you're watching a show as it's coming out like when chernobyl was going on Mm. and we were watching it every week in real time i would go on twitter after each episode Right. And just read the comments, you know, people <laughs> just like posting memes and, you know, Man, all that stuff. Dyatlov became a meme so yeah. fast. And it, like, so fast. I think that that's a really interesting and actually kind of beautiful thing that's come from the internet. I mean, it's also shitty because people are shitty, but <laughs> generally speaking, I would say that was that's kind of a positive thing to come out of having the internet community being able to. I think so. Reflect on that in such in such like a rapid, rapid fire response. Yeah, because they they do catch the excitement of finishing a show, and that's the thing that I've I've realized. Instead of being a super jaded old cranky bastard, I I've been more open to experiencing that wave of of. It's intoxicating to know that so many people feel the same way about you, about anything. Yeah. I mean, it's like, hey, we all like this kind of underwear. I was, all right. There's like three of us. <laughs> but a show like Ted Lasso on the internet, you know, everyone's just talking about the same um, kind of gratification that you get at the end of an episode. Um, yeah. It's just a great feeling. It's yeah. a great community, too. Yeah. Yeah. Man, we went through a lot. We didn't even hit it all. No, <laughs> there's just not enough, not enough room. Um, just I, watch the show, guys. Watch like, the show. Get out there and do it. Don't take our word. Oh, well, if you haven't watched the show and you listen to this whole episode, You're don't even bother idiot. because we ruined it all. <laughs> no, you can still enjoy it, but <laughs> we, we spoiled a lot. Big disclaimers. Um, yeah. Other, otherwise, I mean, that's going to be a big tink. Let's do uh, three tinks to Ted Lasso because we only had one topic today. Wait. There you go. That's how you do it. Um, There's going to be a third season, right? Oh, yeah. They've already been approved. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's, there's going to be a lot to unpack and we're probably going to do a special on Sunday, don't you think? After. <laughs> After. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just talk about the finale. We'll tack it on here. Um for next week i think that's appropriate and see if uh we can go from there but what can our friends do to get in touch with us to let us know their thoughts and feelings um you can subscribe rate and review the podcast and you can email us at our kids asleep at gmail.com um if you want to email us specifically about ted lasso either you've watched it or you watch it because we told you to watch it uh, use the subject line Ted Lasso. That's right. We'll be here for you. We're going to keep podcasting uh, through the night. Uh, no, nah, maybe not through the night, but is that the cats? It was Oscar. Oh, Oscar, come on, man. We're about to end the show. Thank you, folks, so much for listening. We love you dearly, and uh, we'll talk soon. Good night, guys. <laughs>